All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, Barbara, colleagues, uh, Matt. Um, it's a true pleasure to be with you today. And I hope you all stay safe. I hope you all uh, sit and, and will enjoy our meeting. It's a great idea, the first online zebrafish neuroscience meeting. And I'm very, very pleased um, to be with you um, today. I'm often asked, uh, what can we do as scientists during this uh, trying time? And my answer is, if we simply continue our work, if we continue to do science to the best of our abilities, this will be our uh, best and the most important contribution to keeping the world uh, safe and keeping the world sane. Because now we all know that science is important, that we should invest more into science, into education, because it does affect our lives if we don't. So I think we got a very positive, strong message for our profession that science, biomedical science in particular, is very, very important. One day, we will meet in person. The labs will be open again. The students will be back to classes. The streets will be full of life. One day, we will meet in person. But for now, let's roll up our sleeves and let's talk about science. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, some applications and the important uh, uses of zebrafish uh, as a great model for uh, neuroscience research. I'm now switching my presentation to the presentation mode. Um, I hope you can see the first slide. Using zebrafish for neuroscience uh, research and CNS drug discovery. I uh, represent the Zebrafish Neuroscience Research Consortium, which is a constellation of over 30 labs worldwide, from Australia to Canada, from Brazil to the shores of Kamchatka in Russia. It's an open uh, platform for every uh, Zebrafish Neuroscience lab to join. We have a nice Facebook page. Please find us, connect to us. We need to support each other. We need to uh, be together. Uh, you are very welcome to join the ZNRC. But really, what I want to talk uh, to you today about is zebrafish as powerful machines. So the new true title of my talk will be the zebrafish as a powerful machine for neuroscience research. Let's think about zebrafish as a biological machine. Now, what we know today, zebrafish is number one based on the use in biomedical research. Is the set? Uh, is, I'm sorry, second most used. Um, species uh, globally after mice. Uh, you can see data for the United Kingdom. We have similar data for US and for the world in general. So we use zebrafish a lot in biomedical research. If you look at the number of papers in PubMed, you will see that zebrafish is not number two. We have a lot of papers dedicated to mouse and rat research, and then to dogs and cats and, and fruit flies and sea elegants, and zebrafish is trailing behind. So I think this means that we use a lot uh, of zebrafish, but we don't publish as much as our uh, colleagues working with alternative other models. So that means the students have to work harder. The graduate students have to work harder so that we can 
change that situation and we can publish more about zebrafish. Let's think of zebrafish as an important genetic machine. So the homology between humans and, and mice is about 75 to 80 percent. The homology of zebrafish to humans is about 70 percent. So we have a machine that is highly genetically homologous to um, humans. Interestingly enough, uh, you can see on uh, the right the uh, comparison of human and zebrafish and mouse and uh, monkey chromosomes. Zebrafish have almost the same number of chromosomes as humans, 25 and 23. However, of course, they are arranged differently. So, for example, zebrafish don't have X, uh, sex chromosome. So, um, the human X chromosome that you can see at the very top, denoted by the error, and then enlarged at the bottom here, the genes from the human X chromosome, the sex chromosome, are spread all over the zebrafish genome. So, zebrafish are similar, but somewhat different from humans. It's a powerful genetic machine that can tell us about the genetics of different disorders. And as I will share with you later, we can learn from zebrafish. So, they are not little humans, they are not little mice, they are a valuable genetic machine in its own right. I often think of zebrafish as a wonderful, useful time machine. Uh, when Jesus has created universe many, many millions ago, of course, we know that about 400 million years ago, the first fish, the, the first teleost fish have emerged, including our zebrafish. And it would take another 100 million years of evolution for the mammals to emerge and another 70 million years for humans, the primates, to emerge. So the zebrafish uh, species is a powerful time machine because it sends us back in terms of the natural evolution by at least 330 million years. It gives us an opportunity to travel in time. And if we use this zebrafish as a time machine, we should think of zebrafish as an important translational machine. Because what is important is when we identify a specific molecular pathway that is shared across zebrafish and mice and humans, shared across the natural evolution, shared across taxa, across species. That means that we have identified a core, the most important evolutionarily conserved mechanism of a disorder. And anything else that is relatively new is not the core. So when we treat a disorder, we need to hit that disorder right in the heart. We need to hit the disorder um, in its core. And zebrafish uh, provides us that opportunity as an additional reference point that send us, sends us uh, 330 million years back in terms of evolution. So we find a pathway that is shared between zebrafish mice and humans, that means we're hitting the disorder in its core. And new treatments may be based on that knowledge. Think of zebrafish as a neuroscience slot machine, a jackpot situation. When we do research, we always consider several factors. One is phenotypic complexity. Is our model complex enough to allow us to model a specific disorder? If you model diabetes, 
you may not need complex cognitive uh, uh, processing. But if you model uh, schizophrenia, you do need this, and therefore zebrafish or mouse or human as a model needs to have some sort of complexity. Be behavioral, phenotypic, uh, or in general. Then an important consideration is cost. Can we afford to do this model? Can we afford this kind of research? And of course, the, this factor becomes even more important uh, recently. And finally, there is a factor of throughput of our experiments. How much data can we generate per unit of time? How many animals we can test per trial? So all these factors are important. When you put them together, you will see that humans are complex, very complex, but very expensive and not very throughput. C. elegans yeast are very throughput, very cheap, but not complex enough. So the real point where all these three axes intersect is the zebrafish, which is complex enough, yet is incredibly uh, uh, inexpensive and has a tremendous uh, capability for high throughput or medium throughput uh, research. So zebrafish in that sense is indeed a neuroscience slot machine, is a win-win-win situation for us. Now, the big question, of course, is how can we use this powerful biological machine in neuroscience research? So I will illustrate a few applications. I will share with you data from my labs and my collaborators to illustrate several potential applications how we can use zebrafish to advance uh, our biomedical knowledge. As one example, we can use zebrafish to understand the neuroendocrine mechanisms and potentially identify novel drug targets for brain disorders. In collaboration with uh, Brazilian colleagues uh, from the University of Passa Funda, Professor Debreu and Giacomini, we tested uh, melatonin in zebrafish aiming to compare the effects of melatonin in zebrafish in humans and in rodents. Now, melatonin is an important hormone. It plays multiple physiological roles, uh, cellular differentiation, uh, proliferation, uh, apoptosis, and many other functions. But when it comes to brain and behavior, Melatonin is important because it controls the sleep, it controls our affective behaviors, and uh, in, um, for example, depressed people, there is a lack of uh, or reduction of melatonin. Uh, melatonin improves sleep. Melatonin uh, is very important for cognitive functions. It improves memory uh, in humans. It uh, works as an antidepressant. Uh, it also uh, increases neuroprotection and reduces stress. When we talk about rodent models, we see similar things. Melatonin is a powerful uh, anti-anxiety, anti-depressing uh, hormone that improves neuroprotection, that improves cognition, and improves sleep. So the question was, uh, if that happens in uh, uh, mammals, in humans and rodents, what happens with zebrafish? If you look at uh, melatonin receptors and different enzymes of its uh, uh, biosynthesis and metabolism, you will see that there is a striking homology, a, a, real, a really high homology between all these genes there average homology between, uh, let's say, humans and mice is 80%, zebrafish and mice uh, around 68, 
in zebrafish versus human 69. So we're talking about 70 to 80 percent homology of uh, uh, melatonin related genes. When you give melatonin to uh, zebrafish, and here is an experiment uh, uh, run by Raphael, here is uh, his photo, you will see that uh, a chronic treatment with melatonin for 24 hours produces uh, no major changes in the general activity, meaning that it doesn't have like, a stimulant or a hypnotic sedative effect, does not affect zebrafish locomotion distance traveled. However, it produces very prominent, robust anti-anxiety effects. So the way how uh, you measure anxiety in zebrafish is very similar to rodent open field test where you can uh, put fish in the novel tank and fish naturally will dive to stay uh, in a protected uh, uh, area at the bottom and then only later gradually it, it will start moving around and explore. So the more fish explores the top, the less anxiety fish has. And melatonin treatment, like humans, like rodents, produces a very prominent anxiolytic effect. So fish tend to spend more time in the top and they uh, enter the top more often. Meaning that we have identified this core evolutionarily conserved uh, uh, molecular target that it includes not only melatonin, not only melatonin receptors, but the entire melatonin re related molecular machinery that is conserved across species from zebrafish to humans. It means that new anxiolytic drugs can be developed based on this knowledge by targeting melatonin related signaling pathways. Not melatonin per se, but the melatonin related cascade in general. So it gives us multiple opportunities. This knowledge gives us multiple opportunities uh, for developing new principally new um, anxiolytic drugs. Knowing that uh, the animal species that is 400, 4 million uh, years older uh, still has the same molecular uh, signaling cascade that could be targeted. Uh, this knowledge gives us confidence that we indeed identified a core and biologically important pathway that regulates anxiety behavior. So we can help humans uh, by developing new drugs. Another example is, as I mentioned earlier, um, sex uh, is an important biological variable. Can we use zebrafish to understand the contribution of sex in uh, uh, zebrafish behavior and zebrafish drug responses? Can it be relevant to the situation we have in humans? Again, in collaboration with uh, uh, colleagues from University of Pasafunda, we wanted to um, analyze sex differences in zebrafish uh, responses to anxiolytic drugs, melatonin, I mentioned already, and diazepam. Now, interestingly enough, we know that sex is, uh, is an important factor in human CNS traits, also in rodents, but zebrafish have polychromosomal sex determination. This is a a uh, diagram from Anderson et al. showing that zebrafish sex-related, sex-associated loci are spread all over the zebrafish genome. So can we still use zebrafish to analyze sex-related uh, traits when it comes to behavior? So in that experiment, we um, used uh, uh, housing for three weeks of uh, a mixture of uh, males and females, 50 uh, to 50% male to female ratio, 
and then tested their behavior in the novel tank, finding no difference, so no major difference in distance traveled, uh, more turning angle in females, and uh, less freezing episodes, uh, less frozen time, and less talk uh, exploration, which means that zebrafish females, the lady zebrafish, are more active and more anxious than males. Then we separate this fish into two tanks, male only and female only, and house them for three weeks again then tested in the novel tank to again show that there are no differences in distance travel. Um, however, there is still a prominent anxiety in females than males, which indicates that sex is indeed very important in zebrafish behavioral models. We have to consider that as an important biological variable and there are robust sex differences in zebrafish anxiety and activity that we need to consider in our experiments. Now, we next expose zebrafish to two uh, prominent drugs, the anxiolytic melatonin, I already spoke about it, and diazepam, a benzodiazepine uh, ligand. So male only and female only cohorts were treated either with water or melatonin or diazepam for 24 hours. And again, what we see here is that um, females are more anxious, baseline activity of females. Um, baseline exploration activity is less. The freezing time is more. But when we give melatonin, and diazepam to zebrafish, um, there are sex differences. So both se sexes showed anxiolytic responses to melatonin, meaning again, melatonin is a powerful anxiolytic drug, but only males responded to diazepam. Together, that indicates that zebrafish models present robust sex differences, not only in their baseline behaviors, but also in drug responses. And this knowledge can be used to develop what we call personalized medicine because we know that men and women respond differently to different uh, CNS drugs, to antidepressants, to anxiolytics. And zebrafish knowledge helps us understand that better and eventually maybe develop new drugs by screening them in zebrafish in a sex-specific manner. So I think this is uh, very much in line with the recent push by the uh, NIH and the National Science Foundation and other organizations to promote sex-related research, including sex-related neuroscience research and zebrafish, even though they have different sex determination and different sex-related loci, give us this opportunity. I also want to invite you to think of zebrafish as a neurophenotyping machine. Can we expand the available tools to do neurophenotyping in zebrafish? Can we create new tests for zebrafish behavioral analysis? In my laboratory in China, uh, a project led by a smart master student, uh, David Wong, has indicated that although zebrafish behavior can be reliably and traditionally detected using visual signals, zebrafish also emit vibration. And we spent a lot of time, not one, not two, not three months, trying to figure out how to measure vibration before, by trials and errors, we came to the, the setup shown here in the photo where you suspend a light beaker with fish and we decided to use a, a smartphone, like many labs use uh, smartphone apps. Now, there are multiple accelerometers that can measure vibration 
can download them for free. The one that worked for us very well was Vibe Sensor. Um, you have to have a light uh, uh, smartphone uh, so that you can still detect vibration produced by zebrafish locomotion. So again, it took a lot of time for us to figure out that you, from one fish, you may not be able to detect enough signals strong enough. But if you put, uh, for example, five or six fish, you get the signal. Here is an example in the top. It's a signal from uh, a vibration signal. Uh, and usually accelerometers give you the, what, what is called the uh, power frequency spectra, which is power by frequency. And um, what do you see here in the control? That there is a little background noise uh, across multiple frequencies. Uh, that could be vibration of the building, vibration of the floor, vibration of the lab area, vibration uh, of the earth, everything that is, um, could be high frequency, uh, could be noise. But when you put five fish shawl, you will see a peak on the vibration spectrum that corresponds to low frequency between three and five hertz, which is indeed the frequency of animal locomotion, including zebrafish. So you see this peak only when there is fish in the beaker. You will not see that peak if there are no fish. So for the first time, as a proof of concept, using very primitive, very crude approach, we showed that zebrafish, in addition, of course, to well-known visual signals, can emit detectable vibration signal that can be used for behavioral analysis. So we got a new modality, new sensor modality, which could be relevant for studying fish in the darkness, in areas where you cannot detect visual signal. Or you can pair visual signal with vibration and enhance the zebrafish and neurophenotyping screen that way. Then we wanted to show, uh, to test the sensitivity of this method to um, some chemicals. And in this particular case, we were working with uh, kava plant extract. And kava, I will talk about it later, is a powerful uh, sedative and anxiolytic uh, natural medicine that has been used for millennia as a natural sedative in the Pacific uh, region. Uh, exposing zebrafish shawl to kava produces a remarkable reduction in the occurrence, in the height, in the amplitude of the peaks, in the presence of the peaks, uh, on the vibration spectrum, indicating that not only this method is sensitive to the presence of the fish, but it also is um, sensitive to uh, uh, pharmacological modulation, such as the sedative action. And again, this is a very first step in this direction, and other groups may use better and more sensitive uh, uh, sensors and detect better peaks. But the proof of concept is there, and we show that zebrafish screening can be used, um, can be developed based on zebrafish uh, vibration. We're switching the gears, and the next application is to examine whether zebrafish uh, can be a useful model for studying non-pharmacological therapies. The question, uh, experimental question we asked was, can environmental enrichment affect zebrafish behavior? In collaboration with my colleagues from University of Pasafunda, also with Professor Leonard Barcelos, uh, Professor Giacomini and, and Marilia D'Abreu. We uh, wanted to know whether 
housing of zebrafish in barren or enriched environments may affect their behavior and stress responses. So we house zebrafish for two weeks in either a standard environment, in empty tank, or in enriched environment with multiple plants and a gravel. And on day 15, we applied a, a rigorous, uh, zebrafish don't like it, uh, acute net, uh, net stress, chasing fish with a net. Then we tested their behavior in the novel tank and in the, show, uh, in the social preference test shown here. In the show, social preference test, you give a choice between um, an empty compartment and uh, a, a fish containing compartment, and the target zebra fish usually prefers to spend time with uh, uh, conspecifics. So, as you could see, um, stress produced robust responses in both cases. However, uh, enrichment was anti-stress and exerted anxiolytic-like action um, in, in zebrafish in both control and especially in stress uh, responses after acute net stress. Which means that um, environmental enrichment is a powerful uh, approach to uh, uh, modulate zebrafish behavior and this uh, situation can be highly relevant and reinforces the value of non-pharmacological therapy of brain disorders. This is something that uh, we are talking about all the time. Humans are non-compliant. Humans don't want to take pills. Humans are not sensitive to pills. So instead of treating depressed people or anxious people with pills, we may take them out for a walk or we can enrich their daily activities or enrich their environments. So zebrafish experiments show to us that non-pharmacological behavioral cognitive therapy, if you will, works very well in zebrafish. So we can use zebrafish models to study the potential biologics behind non-pharmacological therapy of brain disorders. Another example of how environmental enrichment may play a role comes from a re re very recent experiment uh, where we took zebrafish from a, a common population and housed them in six different tanks for uh, 15 days. The only difference between the tanks was the color, transparent, white, black, yellow, blue, or red. We wanted to know whether colors play a role in modulating zebrafish behavior. We measured zebrafish uh, anxiety in the novel tank, and we analyzed the whole body cortisol levels as well. What we found was that housing for 15 days in tanks of different colors does affect zebrafish activity and anxiety. Some tanks produced uh, more anxiolytic effect, and some tanks, such as transparent, were not, or white, were not. Uh, housing uh, zebrafish in blue tanks, in particular, or in black tanks, was especially uh, anxiolytic for zebrafish. Also produced less uh, cortisol, baseline cortisol, indicating that color becomes an important husbandry factor an important enrichment factor, and it does affect zebrafish behavior, meaning that we need to consider color as an environmental factor, the color of our lab, the color of the animal facility, the color of the equipment, the color of the coats of the experimenters. All that becomes important in zebrafish world. So this uh, knowledge, helps us not only improve the animal welfare, and not only make zebrafish happier, but also improve the data reproducibility, the data reliability in our um, experiments. So zebrafish, again, gave us important hints 
uh, on how to better organize our research. And for this, of course, we are very grateful to um, our little uh, fish friends. The next question is, how to expand the range of behavioral domains in zebrafish research? Okay, we know that zebrafish have activity, uh, they have cognitive behaviors, so cognitive domain is important, they have emotionality, they can feel pain. What else? Can we apply other constructs from the clinical psychology, from the royal literature to zebrafish world? The question we wanted to ask in particular was, do zebrafish experience despair? Of course, you can stress zebrafish with a net or a predator, and they will be very unhappy about it. Can they show something that would be similar to giving up, to learn helplessness, to despair? For this, uh, in collaboration with St. Petersburg University, um, project led by Konstantin Diamond, we reasoned that zebrafish uh, despair can be similar to uh, uh, mouse or uh, rodent models of despair based on the tail suspension. So if you tail suspend a mouse like this, it will produce, uh, 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 it's a called tail suspension test, it will produce a lot of struggling and then it will give up. It will struggle again and give up. Struggle, give up. So you can quantify this immobility time. And then if you inject uh, mice with uh, antidepressants, you will see that antidepressants ex extend the struggling time. So the mice don't give up as uh, 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 easily. So we thought if mice have despair, if mice have learned helplessness, can zebrafish have something like this? For this, we apply the zebrafish tail immobilization test, shown here, like this, when you fix zebrafish by sponge, by its tail, and then you analyze, you apply different stressors or drugs, and you analyze the lateral movements of zebrafish, the zebrafish struggling by recording their activity with, uh, with cameras. So it looks like this. Here is the zebrafish. You can see on, uh, on the uh, middle image, middle top image, um, the red dot denotes the center point of the object. That's what the camera detects. The video tracking software detects as the point to, to monitor. And if the zebrafish produces lateral movements, usually left, right, left, right, multiple times, it can uh, record the uh, frequency of immobility, the duration of mobility, duration of immobility, and distance traveled. Well, not really traveled, distance moved. In several experiments, we applied electric shock, alarm pheromone, and different drugs to show that if you apply electric shock or alarm pheromone, the zebrafish give up they uh, produce less mobility, they struggle less. So again, it's very similar to what you see in rodents when you stress them and they produce more learned helplessness and they struggle less in the tail suspension test. When we treated zebrafish with uh, antidepressants such as sertraline and SSRI and amitriptyline, a tricyclic antidepressant, from two different classes, they produced the opposite effects. They corrected, they rescued the phenotype. So zebrafish, uh, even after being immobilized, they struggle more. This is exactly what, or very similar to what antidepressants do with mice in the tail suspension model of despair. Interestingly enough, a benzodiazepine, phenazepam, did not affect zebrafish responses, indicating that these changes were sensitive to antidepressants, but not sensitive to anxiolytics, providing a very nice dissection between two completely different classes of the drugs. 
We then analyzed uh, neurochemistry behind these responses, showing that if you apply uh, the tail immobilization procedure and compare intact controls with the ZTI exposed fish, and then combine shock and ZTI tail immobilization procedure, there are changes in uh, monominergic neurotransmission, in particular the ratio between the metabolites of serotonin and dopamine to their respective neurotransmitters. So there's changes are similar to what we see in uh, uh, mice experiencing uh, behavioral despair, and also similar to what we see in clinically uh, uh, depressed people. When you give amitriptyline and sertraline, these changes are corrected, are rescued. So this model not only behaviorally sensitive to uh, antidepressants, to two very commonly used uh, clinical antidepressants, but also neurochemically is responding in correct way, similar to what we see in humans and in rodents. So again, for the first time, we showed that zebrafish can develop despair-like behaviors, and these behaviors can be linked to monoaminergic deficits that are corrected by clinically active antidepressants. So when we do zebrafish research, we can discover something new. It can happen every day, today, next week, next year. We just have to look around. We should not stop. It's not a very, very well studied field. So we can continue to discover something new and interesting. And again, remember, if you discover something that is clinically relevant in zebrafish, you're traveling back in time. You travel by 330 million years of natural evolution. Can we expand the range of screening applications uh, of zebrafish models? So, for example, instead of studying pills, can zebrafish screens be developed to screen for herbal medicines? In our Chinese lab, um, we wanted to apply zebrafish models to uh, kava kava, which is the extract of kava plant uh, that is native uh, to the Pacific Islands. I mentioned it briefly already. It has been used in traditional medicine for millennia, including Chinese traditional medicine. You can see the Shenong, the god king of Chinese medicine, apparently cooking some kava plant uh, extract here on this uh, old painting. This is uh, at the bottom what the kava drink, kava drink looks like, and this is a, a powder from kava roots. So. The roots are the most important uh, ingredient, uh, elements of kava, and they're very rich in kava lactones, uh, uh, especially six most uh, uh, biologically active kava lactones. Uh, they all share the same or similar formula, uh, but what is important, they uh, uh, modulate uh, human behavior for centuries have been used uh, to treat uh, anxiety, insomnia, pain. Their major action is inhibition uh, by uh, stimulating uh, GABAergic receptors. Now, we gave kava acutely to zebrafish for 20 minutes and chronically. For the sake of time, I will uh, very briefly explain our findings. So what we did was we looked at behavior, we analyzed cortisol levels, we analyzed the expression of brain genes uh, in order, to, uh, and we also analyzed neurochemical responses, aiming to understand different aspects of kava effects. Now, remembering the vibration screen, we saw very prominent behavioral difference. Kava was sedative in zebrafish. Here in the novel tank test of anxiety in the light dark box, both kava at the top and kava lactones at the bottom produced very prominent uh, uh, sedative effect. We, we see this 
in a nice dose dependent manner, also for aggression, also for the social preference test, and kava also reduced uh, and kava lockdown also reduced cortisol. So produced behavioral inhibition, sedative, and anti stress calming effect. This is what kava does to humans. You drink kava to improve sleep, you drink kava to um, reduce anxiety. And in some countries, kava is freely available. You can, for example, in America, you can go and purchase kava from the kava bars. But in some countries, it is tightly controlled uh, substance. So um, it does work in humans. Now we see that it works very well in zebrafish. Uh, acute kava also increases um, the expression of CFOS and CJUN. And kava lockdowns do exactly the same, indicating that kava extract and kava lockdowns have very similar effects. Um, uh, acute kava exposure potens potentiates uh, brain monoamines by increasing the levels of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So it's kind of a, a pleasant um, mix of uh, monoamines. But interestingly enough, chronic kava, in addition to very prominent behavioral effects, again, same inhibition. As you can see here on this slide, um, ELSA changes the expression of several genes. Importantly, the microglia biomarker genes, such as CD11 beta, uh, the uh, nitric oxide synthase, and some others, astrocyte biomarkers, such as C4B um, and C100 alpha. It upregulates uh, uh, glucocorticoid, but not mineral corticoid receptor genes. Uh, a few um, epigenetic genes we tested, only one was affected, indicating that maybe kava has very mild uh, epigenetic effects, and it also stimulates uh, several uh, uh, inflammation related cytokines, such as TNF alpha, interleukin 6, uh, IL. Uh, one beta and IL-4. So uh, this study was important because it showed for the first time that uh, monoaminergic signaling can be affected by kava and if you use kava as a long-term treatment uh, there are important changes in the activation of neuroglia, uh, inflammatory cytokines uh, uh, and maybe epigenetic modulation that can also play a role. If you're a long-term kava user, uh, maybe we should look at monoamines, not only GABA, but also monoamines, and maybe we should look into uh, the state of microglia, the astrocytes, uh, and an inflammation. So maybe these uh, pathways can be uh, new uh, targets. So for example, if someone develops kava addiction, maybe we can correct their neuroinflammation and that can um, solve the problem. And lastly, uh, one application uh, I want to mention briefly is uh, the use of zebrafish as molecular machine to better understand uh, molecular networks involved in complex behaviors. So, um, in this particular case, we developed a model of chronic stress, applied it to zebrafish, and looked at uh, behavior, neurochemistry, as it develops over time, and uh, after this, we did the, micro, uh, the, the RNA sequencing study to analyze the expression of uh, brain genes. So in multiple cohorts that we run in parallel, for five weeks, we would weekly test and euthanize, of course, uh, some cohorts to test them behaviorally and neurochemically. And we continued with other cohorts. At the end of week four, 
we split the stressed cohort into two, stress and we continued stressing this fish, but also gave them fluoxetine and antidepressant. And then at the end of the study, as I mentioned, we uh, killed all fish and um, analyzed the expression of their uh, brain genes. What we found was that across the time, as you apply one, two, three, four, five week stress batteries, there is an interesting dynamic. There's a complex dynamics of behavioral changes. So when you read papers and one lab uses one week stress, another lab uses two week stress, and the third lab uses four week stress or five week stress, these stressors are not the same. They produce different changes in zebrafish behavior, which uh, we need to know about. But they also produce different changes in neurochemistry of zebrafish. So there are changes in monoamines, in serotonin, in norepinephrine that are uh, developing over time. So week two and week five are different behaviorally and neurochemically. But the most interesting, uh, uh, of course, result came from the analysis of gene expression. So we identified 45 upregulated versus uh, and, and uh, 125 downregulated genes that specifically respond different between controls and chronically stressed fish, five week stressed fish. So when we looked at these genes and used the molecular uh, network uh, modeling using the string database, the pro based on known biological interactions of these uh, 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 genes, their uh, protein products, they clustered into several interesting uh, uh, molecular pathways. As you could see here, these involved aristines and G, uh, PCR related genes, uh, the um, receptor signaling pathway, the ubiquitin related genes uh, and their uh, inflammatory modulation. So uh, the process of regulation of signaling by ubiquitinization. Uh, then another pathway involved inflammation-related transcriptor factors. So we know that inflammation, neuroinflammation is important. So it is indeed important in uh, chronically stressed uh, zebrafish brain. So zebrafish can be used uh, to uh, better understand what's going on with uh, chronically stressed human brain uh, gene expression as a model. And of course, we know that cytoskeletal uh, genes and motility related proteins are important uh, in stress based on rodent literature. And now we see that the same applies to zebrafish. Chronically stressed zebrafish have up or down regulated differentially expressed genes in the uh, molecular machinery involving cytoskeletal and motility and cellular motility. Uh, proteins and um, a little cluster of vitelogenines, which are developmental and estrogen signaling uh, related uh, uh, molecular networks. Network. Uh, so these are the new molecular pathways implicated in chronic stress in zebrafish, and each of these pathway can be potentially a target for. Uh, therapeutical treatment. So this approach gives us one more way to get a bigger picture of global changes uh, in the zebrafish brain as we apply uh, chronic stress, which can then be translated into human situation. So in conclusion, I want to reiterate that zebrafish are a powerful biological machine. They're powerful machines for neuroscience research. They allow us to measure, to objectively quantify stress-related and other behavioral deficits. They allow us to parallel behavioral data with endocrine data. Remember cortisol and melatonin assays I was talking about. 
They provide us with an opportunity to assess novel behavioral endpoints, no, novel locomotor characteristic of behavior, such as vibration, the behavior emitted vibration signal that we can use to characterize zebrafish behavior. They help us to develop uh, models based on newly recognized uh, understudied behavioral domains, such as, for example, uh, behavioral despair in zebrafish that we attempted to model in the zebrafish tail immobilization test. Zebrafish can be used to screen novel and alternative uh, medicines, such as Chinese traditional medicine, the herbs, uh, such as kava, and many others. They can help us uh, to assess the sex uh, related modulation of behavior and uh, neuroactive drug responses uh, to model non pharmacological modulation, such as using environmental enrichment approaches to modulate CNS traits. They help us identify core, important, evolutionarily conserved candidate molecular targets to uh, better understand biological consequences of acute and chronic stress, to parallel behavioral data with neurochemical alterations. Remember how in several models I mentioned, monoamines were uh, significantly uh, modulated, and that modulation was bidirectional by stress and by pharmacological agents to identify potential novel molecular cascades, such as the omics data, uh, implication of neuroinflammation-related genes uh, I mentioned earlier in kava effects, or uh, the genes regulating uh, uh, you know, neuroinflammation and cytoskeletal genes, scaffolding genes, uh, cell motility genes implicated in uh, uh, chronic stress responses. And most importantly, that allows us to have fun all the way as we do research. I think that last part is very important too. As I finish my lecture, I want also to remember some of our friends, our dear friends, who uh, we lost recently. Uh, I'm talking about Christine. Uh, Dr. Bosquet and uh, Jeremy, uh, Dr. Jeremy Ullman. They were very good, uh, brilliant zebrafish investigators, uh, bright, young, curious minds, good friends, very, very active. Many of you knew them personally. They touched our lives, uh, and, and they are very, very sorely missed. I dedicate my lecture in in their to their memory so that we remember them we continue to cite them we continue to use their works and um, it's um it's a good tribute to um, our friends and colleagues but i want to also thank you very much for giving this opportunity for me to outline uh, our vision on how to use zebrafish in neuroscience research. The message is zebrafish rock. And I thank you very much. Share, share. Spasiba very much for your attention. Thank you, guys. Please stay safe. And we will meet again. We'll talk about zebrafish more. And I think it's a great idea to have this uh, international online conference. One day we will meet in person. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I wish you a successful conference and, more importantly, successful uh, experiments with good results, more publications, um, so that we can put zebrafish into the second or maybe one day first most published model place in biomedical research. Thank you very much.